Hello, people back there. Let's worship the Lord. As always, uh, we're battling technology, right? But we're glad that we're able <laughs> yeah, to be always. here together and uh, to rejoice in the Lord. And we give thanks for all the blessings that God has shared with us this past week and the opportunities that lie before us this week to love and serve. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, I may not re recognize that you're visiting with us for the first time because I'm only here for the second time. <laughs> But we welcome you, and we hope you'll let us know who you are so that we can greet you and include you in the family of God here at Hay Street. Are there any announcements that need to be lifted up? I'm not aware of any. I know the Methodist women are planning a trip to the, um, our, the Holy Name of Jesus Cathedral in Raleigh. And if you want to sign up for that, you can find information about that in the email that went out earlier this week. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are grateful that you have welcomed us into this space today to worship you. 
We thank you for those who are leading us through the music. We thank you for each person who listened to the voice of your Holy Spirit this morning, drawing them to this place. We pray that together, in unity in your Holy Spirit, we might worship you and praise your holy name, that our lives might be transformed, that we might be strengthened and renewed so that we can walk together in faith and faithfulness, mm -hmm. serving Christ in our day and time. In his precious and holy name we pray, amen. amen. I'm going to invite Susan and Brian to come forward. We're going to have a liturgy. You may be seated. Uh, this is a liturgy that's found in our book of worship for the welcoming of a new pastoral appointment. And so we'll be using that this morning, and I believe there will be responses for you on the screen in bold print. Good morning, friends. My name is Brian Gaskell, and I have the pleasure of serving as one of your co-lay leaders here at Hay Street. And I would just like to say before we begin the uh, formal liturgy that it is a pleasure and a true joy to have David as our pastor now. Uh, David, it's been a a joy the last couple of months to have you sitting in on our meetings and um, getting acquainted to Hay Street and you've shown that you're a true man of God and very much look forward to having you here and building a friendship in a, with you. Dear friends, today we welcome David Woodhouse who has been appointed to serve as our pastor. We believe that he is well qualified and has been prayerfully appointed by our bishop, Pope Morgan Ward. David you have been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and a sustainer of the love, order, service, and discipleship of the people of God. Today I reaffirm this commitment in the presence of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as people committed to participate in the ministries of the church, by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you who celebrate this new beginning support and uphold David in these ministries? And if you would, please join with me as we respond. We reaffirm our commitment to support you with our prayers, presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger. And would you join me? Who brings good news, who announces salvation. Let us pray. Almighty God, you still call us to go into your service and spread the message of the salvation of your son. Bless richly, we pray, your servant David's entrance into our fellowship. And let him find us an open door for the word. We also pray for your church on earth. Equip us all with a spirit of willingness that we with courage can witness about you by the profession of our mouths and through our joy of living. Grant us all to partake in your strength and joy so that we can enter into the anxiety and suffering of the world to be radiating and make alive that hope which Christ gives all this we dare to pray of you, for you are us the Father of mercy and the God of all grace. You are the Son, the Savior, and the Redeemer. You are the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Helper, and the Giver of life. Blessed to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask Susan to step to the microphone. David, um, accept this Bible and be among us as one who proclaims the word. Amen. David, take this water and baptize new Christians in this place. Amen. Amen. David, take this bread and cup and keep us in communion with Christ and his church. Amen. 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 
David used this hymnal and book of worship to guide us in our prayer and praise. Amen. Amen. David, receive this book of discipline and help us keep the covenant that strengthens our connection as United Methodist. Amen. David, receive this globe and lead us in our mission to this community and all the world. Amen. David, receive this stole signifying your ordination and shepherd us as our pastor. Amen. Amen. This yoke has been laid upon me and I willingly take it upon myself. Let us pray. Lord God, bless the ministries of your church here at Hay Street and throughout the world. We thank you for the variety of gifts you have bestowed upon us. Draw us together in one spirit that each of us may use our differing gifts as members of one body. May your word be proclaimed with faithfulness and may we be doers of your word and not hearers only. As we who have died and risen with Christ in baptism gather at his table and then scatter into the world, May we be one in service to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And this is uh, for all of us to say together. And they want me to kneel while we do this. Congregation, if you would extend your, your right hand. Let us pray, y'all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, David, and give you peace now and forever. Amen. The peace of our Lord always be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Again, it is a true joy, David. Welcome to Hay Street. And for those of you that may just be tuning in, David did give his first message last Sunday, uh, but because of the holiday weekend, we decided to push the uh, official welcome to this Sunday. Now, I believe we have two more songs from the praise band, if I'm not mistaken, so I'll get out of the way. And if, you, if you're in worship, if you care to stand, and let's continue, let's get our praise on, as Gene always says. Right, Gene? All right.
Ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no last days To sing God's praise Than when we first begun
No thing, church, no thing can compare. You, Jesus, are our living hope, your presence, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here in this place. Come and flood us. Rain on us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's hear from Justin with Children's Moment. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I just got back from Camp Rockfish this past week, and one of the things that I really enjoyed doing with the day campers specifically was every day when we would go up to chapel, and I would do chapel with them twice a day, I would say, before we do anything else, I want to pray. And so then the next time I came up and I said, before we do anything else, I want to ride a unicycle. And they were like, wait, what? You want to do what? And I was like, ride a unicycle? Wait, that's not it. I want to, and then some kid was like, pray, and I was like, oh, that's it. So every time I would stand up there and it'd be like, I want to, you know, go hang gliding. And they were like, you want to pray. And I'm like, that's absolutely what I want to do. So before we do anything else, let's ride a unicycle. Pray, let's pray. God, we thank you that we are here and that we are able to be in your presence. We pray that right now, anything that's keeping us from connecting with you, that that would just be put to the side so that we can connect with you wholly and completely. In your name, amen. So I'm going to tell you guys something. I just said that I got back from Camp Rockfish, and I am, much to my dismay, I had to retire one of my favorite shirts because of Camp Rockfish this past week. Um, you see, I have an absolute favorite shirt that I got way back, I think I got it in 2005 or 2006, somewhere in there, and it's a band that is now broken up. It's one of my favorite band t-shirts. It's the absolute most comfortable shirt I own. It's made out of good material. It's super soft. It's like, it's just that shirt. You know how you have like that shirt? It's always like at the top of your laundry pile, always in rotation until like you start to get like maybe a little hole in it somewhere. And then you're like, okay, okay, okay. This is now a special shirt that I can only wear at certain times because I know the number of washes makes this thing limited. This is now a limited edition special. Well, as it turns out, there was this little like storm that came through this past week. I'm not sure if you, you're aware of it, but it, it got super, super muddy. And so I was thinking, okay, I can just wash this shirt and I can get this, this stain out. But it turns out it wasn't mud. So I'm thinking I either spilled coffee on it or I spilled like chocolate ice cream or there's something, something is on this shirt that I cannot get out. I have tried since I've been back. I've tried using Tide. I've tried using white vinegar. I've tried using Shout. I even tried shouting at the shirt, and it didn't work. It didn't work. I was like, get out! When I was talking to the stain, nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I, I tried everything, even just shy of using Clorox. It's a yellow shirt, but I was like, you know what? Having some white spots, maybe we can make it a tie-dye. Who knows? Let me call Jay Poole. He'll have the answer. So as I was trying to get this stain out, it just wasn't happening. Was not working. And I'm just going like, what do I do with this? And then it came to me, you know, we're, we're kind of like, like my shirt, kind of like my favorite shirt. We, 
we try everything we can do to get the stain of sin out of our lives, and it just doesn't happen. We try shouting at it. Maybe we try using different products. Maybe we try using different services. Maybe we try to connect with our friends. Maybe we try to play video games. Maybe we try to do different things to just get away from that feeling of sin, right? Maybe, maybe we even try just going to church and trying that to get that stain of sin out of our lives. But here's the truth of it. There's, there's only one spiritual stain cleanser, and that's Jesus Christ. Psalm 51.7 says, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So maybe some of us here this morning have tried everything to get the stain of sin out of our lives. But have we really tried Jesus? See, the gospel is super simple when you really boil it down. It's two things. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And this is kind of a weird thing to say, but it's, I think I'm going to start doing this every single Sunday morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you want to connect with him, just close your eyes and repeat after me. And the prayer itself isn't what's special, but what is special is making that connection with Christ. So I'm going to do a quick repeat after me prayer, and I'll be in the back if you want to talk later, and we can talk about it some more, and I'll introduce you to that spiritual stain cleanser. Dear Jesus, thank you for forgiving my sins. I want to follow you all of my days. Amen. Thanks, guys. Please keep the family of Al Taylor in your prayers. Uh, we'll be celebrating Al's life on Monday, July the 19th. At uh, 10.30, there will be a visitation in the parlor, and then at 11.30, there will be a service in the sanctuary. And if you could please keep Ruth in in your prayers, I'll be meeting with her tomorrow to discuss the service. And I think Lisa Craver is going to come and help with that service. And Dennis, I want to talk to you about that as well. Uh, but please keep that family in your prayers. And uh, other families in our church, I know uh, Bruce Brown had some knee surgery this week, outpatient surgery, everything went well, but he's not able to be with us this morning because he's home under doctor's orders, keeping that leg propped up. So pray for his good recovery. He said the pain has been very minimal, so he's thankful. Um, as we go to God in prayer this morning, I want to use a prayer from a book that I picked up one year at annual conference. Uh, back in the days when we would actually go to annual conference, um, they would always have a Cokesbury bookstore set up, but the conference media center would also have a grab-and-go table where people who had purchased books and they no longer needed the books would put the books out on tables and it was a free-for-all. Anybody that wanted the books could just come by and collect whatever they wanted. And so I usually would make it a habit to go past that table. And uh, one year, I don't remember which year, I picked this book up just because I like the, the title of it. It says, Pray the Word for Your Church, 31 Prayers That Seek God's Purposes and Power by Tice L. King. And uh, so I want to just, uh, as a part of our prayer time, use one of Tice L. King's prayers and it fits perfectly with the scripture for today, uh, but he quotes a scripture passage from Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. As Jesus is head of the body, the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, Colossians 1, 18. And so today, the focus of this prayer is the proclamation that Jesus is head over all. <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ, on this day, we pronounce over Hay Street United Methodist Church that you rule over all. 
You alone are the head of the body, your church. You are Lord over all, supreme in all things. For God the Father was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in you, Lord Jesus, and through you to reconcile all things to yourself. All things on earth and in heaven. You have brought everything near through your blood shed on the cross. You the righteous one for the unrighteous, that we might be brought into the family of God. Once we were totally separated from the Father. We were orphaned enemies in our minds because of our wickedness. We were without hope and without God. But now, because of your finished work, Lord Jesus, on the cross, we have been reconciled to God, presented as holy, spotless. Strengthen us by your Spirit, I pray, to live out this mystery. May we as your people choose to humble ourselves before you and submit to your word. Destroy pride, self-righteousness, and all strongholds of self-reliance among us. May I and my brothers and sisters in Christ be strengthened to stand firm this day and walk in the great victory of the cross. May we be established and unmovable, always clinging to the hope of the gospel and unaffected by the lies of the accuser. For Jesus Christ, you alone are Lord, to the glory of God the Father, and we are yours. This day, as members of your body, the church, We choose to humble ourselves under your lordship and proclaim that you are head over all. Jesus, you are Lord over your church. And we pause at this time to pray for those who are on our hearts, members of this congregation, members of the larger Fayetteville community, people across our nation and world who are in need of your grace, mercy, love, and healing. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Jesus, you are Lord over our church community, and you are Lord over each of our lives and our life together. Lord Jesus, we make this confession in your mighty name, the name above all names, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen and amen. And I'll just add to what Justin said to you about camp, that one of the great joys and thanksgivings of this week is that Justin said a number of youth there at camp uh, committed their lives to being devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And so I'm grateful for Justin's leadership this week. If you, uh, if you would, please join me in the prayer for illumination as I bring the scripture, as it is printed on the uh, slides. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. I come with the scripture reading this morning from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Hear the word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasures of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, 
according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and his will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Gene, remind me what time we are supposed to depart from this service. <laughs> okay, all right. I appreciate Brian reading that scripture for us, and I appreciate Brian and Susan helping this morning with the liturgy to welcome me to this appointment. Um, I'm grateful to God to have the opportunity to preach and teach and serve among you. I know there are many other gifted folks in this congregation who offer the Word of God on a weekly basis through their Sunday school classes or through group gatherings, and uh, I'm humbled to be among them and to share in uh, the blessing of uh, sharing God's Word with you. Over the next seven weeks, uh, beginning today, I want to embark on a sermon series on Paul's letter to the church. And the earliest copies of that letter don't say to Ephesus. So scholars uh, down through the ages have argued as to whether or not the letter should be called the letter to the Ephesians because the earliest manuscripts that we have don't mention the Ephesians. And it sounds somewhat like Paul is writing to people that he's never met. And we know he had met the Ephesians and spent about two years working and serving among them. Uh, so some think that possibly this letter that we call Ephesians was actually maybe like an encyclical, uh, that uh, Paul wrote it to be a circulating letter, to go around to all the churches, uh, so that every church might be strengthened. And in that sense, it's appropriate that we're here today studying this letter all these thousands of years later, uh, this letter that God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired Paul to write to encourage the church to be the church and to understand the lordship of Jesus Christ and all the implications of that lordship. Uh, but it may well have been written to the Ephesians, so we won't worry too much about that, and we'll just call it Ephesians, and, and we'll join the company of all the churches down through the ages who've referred to this letter as Ephesians. So if you want to find it in your Bible and read it, uh, just look for Ephesians. When I was a kid in Bible school or Sunday school, we were taught how to find Ephesians because we were taught... General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Of course, General Electric Power Company probably doesn't mean much to the, the newest generations, but when I was a kid, everybody knew General Electric Power Company, and we could remember it. So you may want over the next week or two to, to, to read through Ephesians numerous times and say, God, what are you trying to say to me through this ancient letter by the Apostle Paul? In the part that we read today from chapter 1, the first thing that jumped out to me is just blessings. Blessings. We all have blessings, and we are especially blessed as the people of God to be in a relationship with God. Years ago, I was serving a church, and we were trying to figure out, why are we here? And one of the things that we remembered was that in the ancient catechisms of the church, and I may have mentioned this last Sunday, they asked the question, what is the chief end of humanity? They probably said, what is the chief end of man? But, but, but by that, they meant all of humanity. And the expected response was to glorify God. And when we, the church, are about the business, 
the service, the witness of glorifying God, then there is a blessing to that. Uh, we, are, we are in the midst of a sense of fulfillment, in the midst of being who we were created to be. And so uh, this begins with a blessing. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a blessing to be in this relationship to God, and God of all persons is the most blessed. But God shares those blessings with us because it goes on to say, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We believe that in the Word of God, everything that is necessary for us to know with regards to God's work and action in the world in order for us to be saved through Christ, it's there for us. That the, the Scriptures are sufficient in that regard. They don't tell us everything nor could we absorb everything. John, the gospel writer, says at the end of his gospel that if everything Jesus said and did just in that uh, short 33 or so years he was here on earth was written down, all the books in the world couldn't contain everything that Jesus did just, just during that brief period of his three-year ministry. So that not everything is in the Bible, but everything that is needful is there for us. And one of the things that the scriptures tell us here in Ephesians is that Christ, through God the Father, through Christ, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. If there's a spot, as Justin was talking about, that it cannot be removed by human strength or power, God, who raised Jesus from the dead, is able to cleanse us and to make us whole and to give us every spiritual blessing needed. And he tells us that What's happening to us is not an accident. That God chose us before the creation of the world in Christ to be God's people. And we talk about predestined. We are predestined, not necessarily in the strong Calvinist sense of everything that happens to us is already predetermined and we have no free will, but in the sense that God elected us and chose us before the foundation of the world to be a part of God's family, and God made it possible for that to occur by planning for the coming of Jesus Christ and for him to die on the cross and to be raised from the dead in order that we might have forgiveness of sins and, and be able to receive the gift of life through him. He says, you're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, to be pure as our Heavenly Father is pure, perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, to be holy and blameless before Him in love. It's the love of God shed abroad in our lives, in our hearts, in our souls that cleanses us and renews us and makes us holy and blameless. He destined us for adoption as His children. And that uh, understanding of adoption that's included in this passage, in that Greek word, it's the Roman and Greek understanding of a, of a son who's given uh, an adopted place in the father's family and through that legal process is given the full rights of a biologically born son. So there's this strong sense of this is a God declaring, you are mine, you are my son, you are my daughter. Everything that belongs to me belongs to you. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are brothers and sisters with Jesus, the beloved Son of God. And he says he did all of this according to the good will of his pleasure, the good pleasure of his will, and to the praise of his glorious grace. It's grace upon grace, right? Grace is unmerited favor. It's God's love shown for us even when we didn't earn it or deserve it. And so grace upon grace, God wants to be with us. God wants us to be with God. And God made that way possible through Jesus. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And we sing about being washed in the blood and we sing about there's a fountain filled with blood. And we sing about how we are cleansed by the blood of Christ, redeemed, made whole, restored, made new. And, and a part of that is the forgiveness of our trespasses. Paul tells us 
in another letter, Romans, that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no person other than Jesus who is perfect and innocent and righteous, that we've all failed and faltered and made mistakes. But the good news is those sins are forgiven. And the, the stain of our sin is removed from us as far as the east is from the west and is cast into the depths of the sea and remembered no more. And he says all that's according to the riches of God's grace lavished on us. What a powerful image. You know, sometimes we give begrudgingly. God gives lavishly. God gives out of a sense of cheerfulness and joy and thanksgiving. When God created everything, God looked at what God created and said it's good. And when he created us, God said that's very good. We made a mess of it, but God still in his love for us and in his love for us as his creatures has lavished us with his grace. He says, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. If we know Jesus, we know the will of God, and the will of God is to love us. The will of God is to draw us and woo us back to God's self, and God does that through God's provenient grace, the Holy Spirit working in our lives and wooing us back to God, helping us to see uh, sin in our life and to see the remedy for sin in Jesus Christ. God continues to woo us until that point where we accept what Christ has done for us and receive God's justifying grace. And then even after we've receive that provenient grace and that justifying grace, God continues to work on us through his prevailing, sustaining grace that carries us on through the Holy Spirit and to, to the place where we become more and more like Jesus, more and more like the image of the God who created us. And he says, all this is a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. There is a great movement occurring in human history. And sometimes we can't see it, we can't understand it, but it's ongoing. And it's the movement of bringing all things under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and bringing all things together in wholeness in the person of Jesus. All things in heaven and on earth. And that's why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we believe that's the direction that everything is going towards. Now Satan would try to have us believe otherwise <coughs> and would try to cause us to dwell on the things that aren't right and that are broken and that are hurtful and are painful. Satan would have us to remain in a, in a spirit of victimization or angerness or bitterness or envy, or malice, or all those things that the scriptures tell us not to be focused on. But instead, the Holy Spirit says, think on the things that are true and holy and trustworthy and good. Put your focus there, because that's the course of history. That's the, that's the direction history is going in. In Christ, he says, we've also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Our gift, our calling, our vocation, our destiny is to live for the praise of Christ's glory. To be filled with all the good things of God and then to share those with those around us and with the whole world that we might live for the praise of his glory. And as we go through Ephesians, we're going to see how Paul lays out the lordship of Jesus Christ and then lays out that the implication of that lordship is that we are to live in a certain way, live to the praise of his glory and to let our light shine and to let our lives be a beacon to those around us of God's goodness and love and grace and mercy. He says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance. 
God doesn't leave us in a state of wonder. Like, I wonder if I'm saved. I wonder if, if things are going to get better. No, God gives us the, the seal of the Holy Spirit. An assurance through the Holy Spirit that testifies to our spirit that we're God's children and that we can cry out to God in a very familiar way. Abba, Father, Daddy, you are my God and I am your child. The adopted papers that you signed with the blood of your son Jesus Christ are good for all of eternity. And I am yours and you are mine. Jesus' earnest prayer in John chapter 17, I think it is, is where he prays for the unity of the church. He prays for us to be one with the Father, one with him, one with the Holy Spirit, one together in ministry to all the world, as we say in the communion liturgy, until Christ comes again in his final victory and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have that seal through the Holy Spirit. Those young people at camp this week who received Jesus Christ also received the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit's working in their hearts even today, whispering to them, singing God's love song over them, and saying, you are mine. Richard Foster tells the story, some of you may remember Richard Foster, for the author of Celebration of Discipline and Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. He's a Quaker uh, pastor and writer and leader. I love Richard Foster's work. He tells the story of a father who was in a grocery store, and the, the father had his son with him and as they went through the grocery store the child was really upset just not having a good day and so the father just sort of started singing a little song you are mine I love you you're so precious to me just kind of making it up as he went along and all through the store the father sang the song and the child was just as calm as he could be and finally when they got out to the car and the father was putting the child in the car seat and putting the groceries in the car the little boy said sing it again daddy Sing it again. And that's what we say to our Father. That's what those young people from camp are saying to their Father. Sing it again, Daddy. Sing your love song over me. Lavish me with your grace. As we close out this worship service this morning with our closing song, I invite you to just pray that prayer today. Father, lavish me with your grace. Sing your love song over me again today. Mark me with the seal of your Holy Spirit.
so not plan to have Holy Communion this morning, but I noticed that the cups are there. So I want to say a brief prayer for the communion. We won't go through the whole liturgy uh, and make that available to you because I think it's a great, powerful sign mm -hmm. of God's love for us. So Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they might be for us the body and blood of Christ and that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with you, Father, one with your Son, one with the Holy Spirit, and ministry together to all the world until Christ shall come in his final victory and we shall feast at his heavenly banquet table. Truly all power, honor, glory, and might is yours now and forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. You remember, brothers and sisters, how Jesus took the bread gave thanks to his father, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for the, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Thanks be to God for this holy meal. Father, bless your people as they go forth this week to love you. May the seal of your Holy Spirit be evident to all who encounter us. And may we remember that Christ is Lord. And under his lordship, may we work and serve until that day when he returns and all things are placed under his control and power. In his holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.